Section 12 of Library of the World's Best Mystery and Detective Stories, Volume 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Lars Rolander. Library of the World's Best Mystery and Detective Stories, Volume 5, by Julian Hawthorne, Editor. Section 12. The Deserted House, by Ernest Theodore Amadeus Hoffman, Part 1. They were all agreed in the belief that the actual facts of life are often far more wonderful than the invention of even the liveliest imagination can be. It seems to me, spoke Lelio, that history gives proof sufficient of this, and that is why the so-called historical romances seem so repulsive and tasteless to us. Those stories wherein the author mingles the foolish fancies of his meagre brain with the deeds of the great powers of the universe, Franz took the word. It is the deep reality of the inscrutable secrets surrounding us that oppresses us with a might wherein we recognize the spirit that rules, the spirit out of which our being springs. Alas, said Lilio, it is the most terrible result of the fall of man that we have lost the power of recognizing the eternal verities. Many are called, but few are chosen, broke in Franz. Do you not believe that... An understanding of the wonders of our existence is given to some of us in the form of another sense. But if you would allow me to drag the conversation up from these dark regions, where we are in danger of losing our path altogether up into the brightness of light-hearted merriment, I would like to make the scurrilous suggestion that those mortals to whom this gift of seeing the unseen has been given remind me of bats. You know the learned anatomist Spallanzani has discovered a sixth sense in these little animals which can do not only the entire work of the other senses, but work of its own besides. Ho, oh, ho! laughed Edward. According to that, the bats would be the only natural-born clairvoyants. But I know someone who possesses that gift of insight of which you were speaking, in a remarkable degree. Because of it he will often follow for days some unknown person who has happened to attract his attention by an oddity in manner, appearance, or garb. He will ponder to melancholy over some trifling incident, some lightly told story. He will combine the antipodes and raise up relationships in his imagination, which are unknown to everyone else. "'Wait a bit,' cried Lelio. It's our Theodore of whom you are speaking now, and it looks to me as if he were having some weird vision at this very moment. See how strangely he gazes out into the distance. Theodore had been sitting in silence up to this moment. Now he spoke. If my glances are strange, it is because they reflect the strange things that were called up before my mental vision by your conversation the memories of a most remarkable adventure. Oh, tell it to us, interrupted his friends. Gladly, continued Theodore, but first let me set right a slight confusion in your ideas on the subject of the mysterious. You appear to confound what is merely odd and unusual with what is really mysterious or marvelous, that which surpasses comprehension or belief. The odd and the unusual it is true, spring often from the truly marvellous, and the twigs and flowers hide the parent stem from our eyes. Both the odd and the unusual, and the truly marvellous, are mingled in the adventure which I am about to narrate to you, mingled in a manner which is striking and even awesome. With these words Theodore drew from his pocket a notebook, in which, as his friends knew, he had written down the impressions of his late journeyings. Refreshing his memory by a look at its pages now and then, he narrated the following story. You know already that I spent the greater part of last summer in X. The many old friends and acquaintances I found there, the free, jovial life, the manifold artistic and intellectual interests, all these combined to keep me in that city. 
I was happy as never before, and found rich nourishment for my old fondness for wandering alone through the streets, stopping to enjoy every picture in the shop windows, every placard on the walls, or watching the passers-by and choosing some, one or the other of them, to cast his horoscope secretly to myself. There is one broad avenue leading to the gate, and lined with handsome buildings of all descriptions, which is the meeting-place of the rich and fashionable world. The shops which occupied the ground floor of the tall palaces are devoted to the trade in articles of luxury, and the apartments above are the dwellings of people of wealth and position. The aristocratic hotels are to be found in this avenue. The palaces of the foreign ambassadors are there, and you can easily imagine that such a street would be the center of the city's life and gaiety. I had wandered through the avenue several times, when one day my attention was caught by a house which contrasted strangely with the others surrounding it. Picture to yourself a low building, but four windows broad, crowded in between two tall, handsome structures. Its one upper story was little higher than the tops of the ground-floor windows of its neighbors. Its roof was dilapidated, its windows patched with paper, its discolored walls spoke of years of neglect. You can imagine how strange such a house must have looked in this street of wealth and fashion. Looking at it more attentively, I perceived that the windows of the upper story were tightly closed and curtained, and that a wall had been built to hide the windows of the ground floor. The entrance gate, a little to one side, served also as a doorway for the building, but I could find no sign of latch, lock, or even a bell on this gate. I was convinced that the house must be unoccupied, for at whatever hour of the day I happened to be passing, I had never seen the faintest signs of life about it. An unoccupied house in this avenue was indeed an odd sight. But I explained the phenomenon to myself by saying that the owner was doubtless absent upon a long journey, or living upon his country estates, and that he perhaps did not wish to sell or rent the property, preferring to keep it for his own use in the eventuality of a visit to the city. You all, the good comrades of my youth, know that I have been prone to consider myself a sort of clairvoyant, claiming to have glimpses of a strange world of wonders, a world which you, with your hard common sense, would attempt to deny or laugh away. I confess that I often lost myself in mysteries, which, after all, turned out to be no mysteries at all and it looked at first as if this was to happen to me in the matter of the deserted house, that strange house which drew my steps and my thoughts to itself with a power that surprised me. But the point of my story will prove to you that I am right in asserting that I know more than you do. Listen now to what I am about to tell you. One day, at the hour in which the fashionable world is accustomed to promenade up and down the avenue, I stood as usual before the deserted house, lost in thought. Suddenly I felt without looking up that someone had stopped beside me, fixing his eyes on me. It was Count P., whom I had found much in sympathy with many of my imaginings, and I knew that he also must have been deeply interested in the mystery of this house. It surprised me not a little, therefore, that he should smile ironically when I spoke of the strange impression that this deserted dwelling here in the gay heart of the town had made upon me. But I soon discovered the reason for his irony. Count P. had gone much farther than myself in his imaginings concerning the house. He had constructed for himself a complete history of the old building, a story weird enough to have been born in the fancy of a true poet. It would give me great pleasure to relate this story to you, but the events which happened to me in this connection are so interesting that I feel I must proceed with the narration of them at once. When the Count had completed his story to his own satisfaction, imagine his feelings on learning one day that the old house contained nothing more mysterious than a cake bakery belonging to the pastry-cook whose handsome shop adjoined the old structure. 
The windows of the ground floor were walled up to give protection to the ovens, and the heavy curtains of the upper story were to keep the sunlight from the wares laid out there. When the Count informed me of this, I felt as if a bucket of cold water had been suddenly thrown over me. The demon, who is the enemy of all poets, caught the dreamer by the nose and tweaked him painfully. And yet, in spite of this prosaic explanation, I could not resist stopping before the deserted house whenever I passed it, and gentle tremors rippled through my veins as vague visions arose of what might be hidden there. I could not believe in this story of the cake and candy factory. Through some strange freak of the imagination, I felt as a child feels when some fairy tale has been told it to conceal the truth it suspects. I scolded myself for a silly fool. The house remained unaltered in its appearance, and the visions faded in my brain, until one day a chance incident woke them to life again. I was wandering through the avenue as usual, and as I passed the deserted house, I could not resist a hasty glance at its close curtained upper windows. But as I looked at it, the curtain on the last window near the pastry shop began to move. A hand, an arm, came out from between its folds. I took my opera glass from my pocket and saw a beautifully formed woman's hand, on the little finger of which a large diamond sparkled in unusual brilliancy. A rich bracelet glittered on the white rounded arm. The hand set a tall, oddly formed crystal bottle on the window ledge, and disappeared again behind the curtain. I stopped as if frozen to stone. A weirdly pleasurable sensation, mingled with awe, streamed through my being with the warmth of an electric current. I stared up at the mysterious window, and a sigh of longing arose from the very depths of my heart. When I came to myself again, I was angered to find that I was surrounded by a crowd which stood gazing up at the window with curious faces. I stole away inconspicuously, and the demon of all things prosaic whispered to me that what I had just seen was the rich pastry cook's wife, in her Sunday adornment placing an empty bottle, used for rose water or the like, on the window sill. Nothing very weird about this. Suddenly a most sensible thought came to me. I turned and entered the shining mirror wall shop of the pastry cook. Blowing the steaming foam from my cup of chocolate, I remarked, You have a very useful addition to your establishment next door. The man leaned over his counter and looked at me with a questioning smile, as if he did not understand me. I repeated that in my opinion he had been very clever to set up his bakery in the neighboring house, although the deserted appearance of the building was a strange sight in its contrasting surroundings. "'Why, sir,' began the pastry cook, "'who told you that the house next door belongs to us? Unfortunately, every attempt on our part to acquire it has been in vain, and I fancy it's all the better so, for there is something queer about the place. You can imagine, dear friends, how interested I became upon hearing these words, and that I begged the man to tell me more about the house. I do not know anything very definite, sir, he said. All that we know for certainty is that the house belongs to the Countess S., who lives on her estates and has not been to the city for years. This house, so they tell me, stood in its present shape before any of the handsome buildings were raised, which are now the pride of our avenue, and in all these years there has been nothing done to it except to keep it from actual decay. Two living creatures alone dwell there, an aged misanthrope of a steward and his melancholy dog which occasionally howls at the moon from the back courtyard. According to the general story, the deserted house is haunted. In very truth, my brother, who is the owner of this shop, and myself, have often, when our business kept us awake during the silence of the night, heard strange sounds from the other side of the wall. There was a rumbling and a scraping that frightened us both and not very long ago we heard one night a strange singing which I could not describe to you. It was evidently the voice of an old woman, 
but the tones were so sharp and clear, and ran up to the top of the scale in cadences and long trills, the like of which I have never heard before, although I have heard many singers in many lands. It seemed to be a French song, but I am not quite sure of that, for I could not listen long to the mad, ghostly singing. It made the hair stand erect on my head. And at times, after the street noises are quiet, we can hear deep sighs and sometimes a mad laugh, which seemed to come out of the earth. But if you lay your ear to the wall in our back room, you can hear that the noises come from the house next door. He led me into the back room and pointed through the window. And do you see that iron chimney coming out of the wall there? It smokes so heavily sometimes, even in summer when there are no fires used, that my brother has often quarrelled with the old steward about it, fearing danger. But the old man excuses himself by saying that he was cooking his food. Heaven knows what the queer creature may eat, for often, when the pipes is smoking heavily, a strange and queer smell can be smelled all over the house. The glass doors of the shop creaked in opening. The pastry-cook hurried into the front room, and when he had nodded to the figure now entering, he threw a meaning glance at me. I understood him perfectly. Who else could this strange guest be but the steward who had charge of the mysterious house? Imagine a thin little man with a face the color of a mummy, with a sharp nose, tight-set lips, green cat's eyes, and a crazy smile his hair dressed in the old-fashioned style, with a high toupee and a bag at the back, and heavily powdered. He wore a faded old brown coat, which was carefully brushed, grey stockings, and a broad, flat-toed shoes with buckles. And imagine further that in spite of his meagerness this little person is robustly built, with huge fists and long, strong fingers, and that he walks to the shop-counter with a strong, firm step, smiling his imbecile smile, and whining out, A couple of candied oranges, a couple of macaroons, a couple of sugared chestnuts. Picture all this to yourself, and judge whether I had not sufficient cause to imagine a mystery here. The pastry-cook gathered up the wares the old man had demanded. "'Wait out, wait out, honoured neighbour,' moaned the strange man, as he drew out a little leathern bag and sought in it for his money. I noticed that he paid for his purchase in worn old coins, some of which were no longer in use. He seemed very unhappy and murmured, "'Sweet, sweet, it must all be sweet. Well, let it be. The devil has pure honey for his bride, pure honey.' The pastry-cook smiled at me, and then spoke to the old man. "'You do not seem to be quite well. Yes, yes, old age, old age. It takes the strength from our limbs.' The old man's expression did not change, but his voice went up. "'Old age, old age, lose strength, grow weak, oh And with this he clapped his hands together until the joints cracked, and sprang high up into the air, until the entire shop trembled and the glass vessels on the walls and counters rattled and shook. But in the same moment a hideous screaming was heard. The old man had stepped on his black dog, which, creeping in behind him, had laid itself at his feet on the floor. "'Devilish beast, dog of hell!' groaned the old man in his former miserable tone, opening his bag and giving the dog a large macaroon. The dog, which had burst out into a cry of distress that was truly human, was quiet at once, sat down on its haunches, and gnawed at the macaroon like a squirrel. When it had finished its tidbit, the old man had also finished the packing up and putting away of his purchases. "'Good night, honoured neighbour,' he spoke, taking the hand of the pastry-cook, and pressing it until the latter cried aloud in pain. The weak old man wishes you a good night, most honourable sir neighbour, he repeated, and then walked from the shop, followed closely by his black dog. The old man did not seem to have noticed me at all. 
I was quite dumbfoundered in my astonishment. There you see, began the pastry cook. This is the way he acts when he comes in here, two or three times a month, it is. But I can get nothing out of him except the fact that he was a former valet of Countess, that he is now in charge of this house here, and that every day for many years now he expects the arrival of his master's family. My brother spoke to him one day about the strange noises at night, but he answered calmly, Yes, people say the ghosts walk about in the house, but do not believe it, for it is not true. The hour was now come when fashion demanded that the elegant world of the city should assemble in this attractive shop. The doors opened incessantly, the place was thronged, and I could ask no further questions. This much I knew, that Count P.'s information about the ownership and the use of the house were not correct. Also that the old steward, in spite of his denial, was not living alone there, and that some mystery was hidden behind its discolored walls. How could I combine the story of the strange and gruesome singing with the appearance of the beautiful arm at the window? That arm could not be part of the wrinkled body of an old woman. The singing, according to the pastry's cook's story, could not come from the throat of a blooming and youthful maiden. I decided in favor of the arm, as it was easy to explain to myself that some trick of acoustics had made the voice sound sharp and old, or that it had appeared so only in the pastry cook's fair, distorted imagination. Then I thought of the smoke, the strange odors, the oddly formed crystal bottle that I had seen, and soon the vision of a beautiful creature, held enthralled by fatal magic, stood as if alive before my mental vision. The old man became a wizard who, perhaps quite independently of the family he served, had set up his devil's kitchen in the deserted house. My imagination had begun to work, and in my dreams that night I saw clearly the hand with a sparkling diamond on its finger, the arm with a shining bracelet. From out thin gray mists there appeared a sweet face with sadly imploring blue eyes, then the entire exquisite figure of a beautiful girl, and I saw that what I had thought was mist was the fine steam flowing out in circles from a crystal bottle held in the hands of the vision. O oh, fairest creature of my dreams, I cried in rapture, reveal to me where thou art, what it is that enthralls thee. Ah, I know it. It is black magic that holds thee captive. Thou art the unhappy slave of that malicious devil who wanders about brown-clad and bewigged in pastry shops, scattering their wares with his unholy springing and feeding his demon dog on macaroons, after they have howled out satanic measure in five-eight time. Oh, I know it all, thou fair and charming vision. The diamond is the reflection of the fire of thy heart, but that bracelet about thine arm is a link of the chain which the brown-clad one says is a magnetic chain. Do not believe it, O oh, glorious one. See how it shines in the blue fire from the retort. One moment more, and thou art free. And now, O oh, maiden, Open thy rosebud mouth, and tell me. In this moment a gnarled fist leaped over my shoulder and clutched at the crystal bottle, which sprang into a thousand pieces in the air. With a faint, sad moan, the charming vision faded into the blackness of the night. When morning came to put an end to my dreaming, I hurried to the avenue and placed myself before the deserted house. Heavy blinds were drawn before the upper windows. The street was still quite empty, and I stepped close to the windows of the ground floor and listened and listened, but I heard no sound. The house was as quiet as the grave. The business of the day began. The passers-by became more numerous, and I was obliged to go on. I will not weary you with the recital of how for many days I crept about the house at that hour, 
but without discovering anything of interest. None of my questionings could reveal anything to me, and the beautiful picture of my vision began finally to pale and fade away. At last, as I passed late one evening, I saw that the door of the deserted house was half open, and the brown-clad old man was peeping out. I stepped quickly to his side with a sudden idea. "'Does not Councillor Binder live in this house?' Thus I asked the old man, pushing him before me as I entered the dimly lighted vestibule. The guardian of the old house looked at me with his piercing eyes, and answered in gentle, slow tones, "'No, he does not live here. He never has lived here. He never will live here. He does not live anywhere on this avenue. But people say the ghosts walk about in this house. Yet I can assure you that it is not true. It is a quiet, a pretty house, and to-morrow the gracious Countess S. will move into it.' "'Good night, dear gentlemen.' With these words the old man maneuvered me out of the house and locked the gate behind me. I heard his feet drag across the floor, I heard his coughing and the rattling of his bunch of keys, and I heard him descend some steps. Then all was silent. During the short time that I had been in the house, I had noticed that the corridor was hung with old tapestries and furnished like a drawing-room with large heavy chairs in red damask. And now, as if called into life by my entrance into the mysterious house, my adventures began. The following day, as I walked through the avenue in the noon hour, and my eyes sought the deserted house as usual, I saw something glistening in the last window of the upper story. Coming nearer, I noticed that the outer blind had been quite drawn up and the inner curtain slightly opened. The sparkle of a diamond met my eye. Oh, kind heaven! The face of my dream looked at me, gently imploring from above the rounded arm on which her head was resting. But how was it possible to stand still in the moving crowd without attracting attention. Suddenly I caught sight of the benches placed in the gravel walk in the center of the avenue, and I saw that one of them was directly opposite the house. I sprang over to it, and leaning over its back, I could stare up at the mysterious window undisturbed. Yes, it was she, the charming maiden of my dream, but her eye did not seem to seek me as I had at first thought. Her glance was cold and unfocused, and had it not been for an occasional motion of the hand and arm, I might have thought that I was looking at a cleverly painted picture. I was so lost in my adoration of the mysterious being in the window, so aroused and excited throughout all my nerve centers, that I did not hear the shrill voice of an Italian street hawker who had been offering me his wares for some time. Finally he touched me on the arm. I turned hastily and commanded him to let me alone. But he did not cease his entreaties, asserting that he had earned nothing to-day, and begging me to buy some small trifle from him. Full of impatience to get rid of him, I put my hand in my pocket. With the words, I have more beautiful things here, he opened the under-drawer of his box, and held out to me a little round pocket-mirror, in it, as he held it up before my face, I could see the deserted house behind me, the window, and the sweet face of my vision there. I bought the little mirror at once, for I saw that it would make it possible for me to sit comfortably and inconspicuously, and yet watch the window. The longer I looked at the reflection in the glass, the more I fell captive to a weird and quite indescribable sensation which I might almost call a waking dream. It was as if a lethargy had lain my eyes, holding them fastened on the glass beyond my power to loosen them. Through my mind there rushed the memory of an old nurse's tale of my earliest childhood, when my nurse was taking me off to bed, and I showed an inclination to stand peering into the great mirror in my father's room, 
she would tell me that when children looked into mirrors in the night time they would see a strange hideous face there and their eyes would be frozen so that they could not move them again the thought struck awe to my soul but i could not resist a peep at the mirror i was so curious to see the strange face once i did believe that i saw two hideous glowing eyes shining out of the mirror i screamed and fell down in a swoon all these foolish memories of my early childhood came trooping back to me my blood ran cold through my veins i would have thrown the mirror from me but i could not and now at last the beautiful eyes of the fair vision looked at me her glance sought mine and shone deep down into my heart the terror i had felt left me giving way to the pleasurable pain of sweetest longing you have a pretty little mirror there said a voice beside me i awoke from my dream and was not a little confused when i saw smiling faces looking at me from either side several persons had sat down upon my bench and it was quite certain that my staring into the window and my probably strange expression had afforded them great cause for amusement you have a pretty little mirror there repeated the man as i did not answer him his glance said more and asked without words the reason of my staring so oddly into the little glass he was an elderly man neatly dressed and his voice and eyes were so full of good nature that i could not refuse him my confidence i told him that i had been looking in the mirror at the picture of a beautiful maiden who was sitting at a window of the deserted house i went even farther i asked the old man if he had not seen the fair face himself over there in the old house in the last window he repeated my question in a tone of surprise yes yes i exclaimed the old man smiled and answered well well that was a strange delusion my old eyes thank heaven for my old eyes yes yes sir i saw a pretty face in the window there with my own eyes but it seemed to me to be an excellently well-painted oil portrait i turned quickly and looked toward the window there was no one there and the blind had been pulled down yes continued the old man yes sir now it is too late to make sure of the matter for just now the servant who as i know lives there alone in the house of the countess s took the picture away from the window after he had dusted it and let down the blinds was it then surely picture i asked again in bewilderment you can trust my eyes replied the old man the optical delusion was strengthened by your seeing only the reflection in the mirror and when i was in your years it was easy enough for my fancy to call up the picture of a beautiful maiden but the hand and arm moved i exclaimed oh yes they moved indeed they moved said the old man smiling as he patted me on the shoulder then he arose to go and bowing politely closed his remarks with the words beware of mirrors which can lie so vividly your obedient servant sir you can imagine how i felt when i saw that he looked upon me as a foolish phantast i began to be convinced that the old man was right and that it was only my absurd imagination which insisted on raising up mysteries about the deserted house i hurried home full of anger and disgust and promised myself that i would not think of the mysterious house and would not even walk through the avenue for several days i kept my vow spending my days working at my desk and my evenings in the company of jovial friends leaving myself no time to think of the mysteries which so enthralled me and yet it was just in these days that i would start up out of my sleep as if awakened by a touch only to find that all that had aroused me was merely the thought of that mysterious being whom i had seen in my vision and in the window of the deserted house even during my work or in the midst of a lively conversation with my friends 
I felt the same thought shoot through me like an electric current. I condemned the little mirror in which I had seen the charming picture to a prosaic daily use. I placed it on my dressing table that I might bind my cravat before it, and thus it happened one day when I was about to utilize it for this important business that its glass seemed dull and that I took it up and breathed on it to rub it bright again. My heart seemed to stand still. Every fiber in me trembled in delightful awe. Yes, that is all the name I can find for the feeling that came over me, when, as my breath clouded the little mirror, I saw the beautiful face of my dreams arise and smile at me through blue mists. You laugh at me? You look upon me as an incorrigible dreamer? Think what you will about it, the fair face looked at me from out of the mirror. But as soon as the clouding vanished, the face vanished in the brightened glass. I will not weary you with a detailed recital of my sensations the next few days. I will only say that I repeated again the experiments with the mirror, sometimes with success, sometimes without. When I had not been able to call up the vision, I would run to the deserted house and stare up at the windows, but I saw no human being anywhere about the building. I lived only in the thoughts of my vision. Everything else seemed indifferent to me. I neglected my friends and my studies. The tortures in my soul passed over into, or rather mingled with, physical sensations which frightened me, and which at last made me fear for my reason. One day, after an unusually severe attack, I put my little mirror in my pocket and hurried to the home of Dr. K., who was noted for his treatment of those diseases of the mind out of which physical diseases so often grow. I told him my story. I did not conceal the slightest incident from him and I implored him to save me from the terrible fate which seemed to threaten me. He listened to me quietly, but I read astonishment in his glance. Then he said, The danger is not as near as you believe, and I think that I may say that it can be easily prevented. You are undergoing an unusual psychical disturbance beyond a doubt. But the fact that you understand that some evil principle seems to be trying to influence you gives you a weapon by which you can combat it. Leave your little mirror here with me and force yourself to take up with some work which will afford scope for all your mental energy. Do not go to the avenue. Work all day from early to late, then take a long walk and spend your evenings in the company of your friends. Eat heartily, and drink heavy, nourishing wines. You see, I am endeavoring to combat your fixed idea of the face in the window of the deserted house and in the mirror, by diverting your mind to other things and by strengthening your body. You yourself must help me in this. I was very reluctant to part with my mirror. The physician, who had already taken it, seemed to notice my hesitation. He breathed upon the glass, and holding it up to me, he asked, Do you see anything? Nothing at all, I answered, for so it was. Now breathe on the glass yourself, said the physician, laying the mirror in my hands. I did as he requested. There was the vision even more clearly than ever before. "'There she is!' I cried aloud. The physician looked into the glass, and then said, "'I cannot see anything, but I will confess to you that when I looked into this glass a queer shiver overcame me, passing away almost at once. Now do it once more.' I breathed upon the glass again, and the physician laid his hand upon the back of my neck. The face appeared again, and the physician, looking into the mirror over my shoulder, turned pale. Then he took the little glass from my hands, looked at it attentively, and locked it into his desk, returning to me after a few moments' silent thought. "'Follow my instructions strictly,' he said. 
I must confess to you that I do not yet understand those moments of your vision, but I hope to be able to tell you more about it very soon. End of section 12. Read by Lars Rolander. Section 13 of Library of the World's Best Mystery and Detective Stories, Volume 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Lars Rolander. Library of the World's Best Mystery and Detective Stories, Volume 5, by Julian Hawthorne, Editor. Section 13. The Deserted House by Ernest Theodore Amadeus Hoffman. Part 2. Difficult as it was to me, I forced myself to live absolutely according to the doctor's orders. I soon felt the benefit of the steady work and the nourishing diet, and yet I was not free from those terrible attacks which would come either at noon or more intensely still at midnight. Even in the midst of a merry company, in the enjoyment of wine and song, glowing daggers seemed to pierce my heart, and all the strength of my intellect was powerless to resist their might over me. I was obliged to retire, and could not return to my friends until I had recovered from my condition of lethargy. It was in one of these attacks, an unusually strong one, that such an irresistible mad longing for the picture of my dreams came over me that I hurried out into the street and ran toward the mysterious house. While still at a distance from it, I seemed to see lights shining out through the fast-closed blinds, but when I came nearer I saw that all was dark. Crazy with my desire, I rushed to the door. It fell back before the pressure of my hand. I stood in the dimly lighted vestibule, enveloped in a heavy, close atmosphere. My heart beat in strange fear and impatience. Then suddenly a long, sharp tone, as from a woman's throat, shrilled through the house. I know not how it happened that I found myself suddenly in a great hall, brilliantly lighted and furnished in old-fashioned magnificence, of golden chairs and strange Japanese ornaments. Strongly perfumed incense arose in blue clouds about me. Welcome, welcome, sweet bridegroom, the hour has come, our bridal hour. I heard these words in a woman's voice, and as little as I can tell how I came into the room, just so little do I know how it happened, that suddenly a tall, youthful figure, richly dressed, seemed to arise from the blue mists. With a repeated shrill cry, Welcome, sweet bridegroom, she came toward me with outstretched arms, and a yellow face, distorted with age and madness, stared into mine. I fell back in terror, but the fiery, piercing glance of her eyes, like the eyes of a snake, seemed to hold me spellbound. I did not seem able to turn my eyes from this terrible old woman. I could not move another step. She came still nearer, and it seemed to me suddenly as if her hideous face were only a thin mask beneath which I saw the features of the beautiful maiden of my vision. Already I felt the touch of her hands, when suddenly she fell at my feet with a loud scream, and a voice behind me cried, Aha! Is the devil playing his tricks with your grace again? To bed, to bed, your grace, else there will be blows, mighty blows. I turned quickly and saw the old steward in his nightclothes, swinging a whip above his head. He was about to strike the screaming figure at my feet when I caught at his arm. But he shook me from him, exclaiming, The devil, sir, that old Satan would have murdered you if I had not come to your aid. Get away from here at once. I rushed from the hall and sought in vain in the darkness for the door of the house. Behind me I heard the hissing blows of the whip and the old woman's screams. I drew breath to call aloud for help, when suddenly the ground gave way under my feet. 
I fell down a short flight of stairs, bringing up with such force against a door at the bottom that it sprang open, and I measured my length on the floor of a small room. From the hastily vacated bed and from the familiar brown coat hanging over a chair, I saw that I was in the bedchamber of the old steward. There was a trampling on the stair, and the old man himself entered hastily, throwing himself at my feet. "'By all the saints, sir,' he entreated with folded hands, "'whoever you may be, and however her grace, that old Satan of which has managed to entice you to this house, do not speak to any one of what has happened here. It will cost me my position. Her crazy excellency has been punished.' and is bound fast in her bed. Sleep well, good sir, sleep softly and sweetly. It is a warm and beautiful July night. There is no moon, but the stars shine brightly. A quiet good night to you. While talking, the old man had taken up a lamp, had led me out of the basement, pushed me out of the house door, and locked it behind me. I hurried home bewildered, and you can imagine that I was too much confused by the gruesome secret to be able to form any explanation of it in my own mind for the first few days. Only this much was certain, that I was now free from the evil spell that had held me captive so long. All my longing for the magic vision in the mirror had disappeared and the memory of the scene in the deserted house was like the recollection of an unexpected visit to a madhouse. It was evident beyond a doubt that the steward was the tyrannical guardian of a crazy woman of noble birth, whose condition was to be hidden from the world. But the mirror, and all the other magic, listen, and I will tell you more about it. Some few days later I came upon Count P. at an evening entertainment. He drew me to one side and said with a smile, Do you know that the secrets of our deserted house are beginning to be revealed? I listened with interest, but before the Count could say more, the doors of the dining room were thrown open, and the company proceeded to the table. Quite lost in thought at the words I had just heard, I had given a young lady my arm, and had taken my place mechanically in the ceremonious procession. I led my companion to the seats arranged for us, and then turned to look at her for the first time. The vision of my mirror stood before me, feature for feature. There was no deception possible. I trembled to my innermost heart, as you can imagine, but I discovered that there was not the slightest echo even in my heart of the mad desire which had ruled me so entirely when my breath drew out the magic picture from the glass. My astonishment, or rather my terror, must have been apparent in my eyes. The girl looked at me in such surprise that I endeavored to control myself sufficiently to remark that I must have met her somewhere before. Her short answer to the effect that this could hardly be possible, as she had come to the city only yesterday, for the first time in her life, bewildered me still more, and threw me into an awkward silence. The sweet glance from her gentle eyes brought back my courage, and I began a tentative exploring of this new companion's mind. I found that I had before me a sweet and delicate being, suffering from some psychic trouble. At a particularly merry turn of the conversation, when I would throw in a daring word like a dash of pepper, she would smile, but her smile was pained as if a wound had been touched. "'You are not very merry tonight, Countess. Was it the visit this morning?' An officer sitting near us had spoken these words to my companion, but before he could finish his remark, his neighbor had grasped him by the arm and whispered something in his ear while a lady at the other side of the table, with glowing cheeks and angry eyes, began to talk loudly of the opera she had heard last evening. Tears came to the eyes of the girl sitting beside me. "'Am I not foolish?' she turned to me, a few moments before she had complained of headache. "'Merely the usual evidences of a nervous headache,' I answered in an easy tone and there is nothing better for it than the merry spirit which bubbles in the foam of this poet's nectar. 
With these words I filled her champagne glass, and she sipped at it as she threw me a look of gratitude. Her mood brightened, and all would have been well had I not touched a glass before me with unexpected strength, arousing from it a shrill, high tone. My companion grew deadly pale, and I myself felt a sudden shiver, for the sound had exactly the tone of the mad woman's voice in the deserted house. While we were drinking coffee, I made an opportunity to get to the side of Count P. He understood the reason for my movement. Do you know that your neighbor is Countess Edwina S., and do you know also that it is her mother's sister who lives in the deserted house, incurably mad for many years? This morning both mother and daughter went to see the unfortunate woman. The old steward, the only person who is able to control the countess in her outbreaks, is seriously ill, and they say that the sister has finally revealed the secret to Dr. K., this eminent physician will endeavor to cure the patient, or, if this is not possible, at least to prevent a terrible outbreak of mania. This is all that I know yet. Others joined us, and we were obliged to change the subject. Dr. K. was the physician to whom I had turned in my own anxiety, and you can well imagine that I hurried to him as soon as I was free, and told him all that had happened to me in the last days. I asked him to tell me as much as he could about the mad woman, for my own peace of mind, and this is what I learned from him under promise of secrecy. Angelica, Countess Set, thus the doctor began, had already passed her thirtieth year, but was still in full possession of great beauty, when Count S., although much younger than she, became so fascinated by her charm that he wooed her with ardent devotion, and followed her to her father's home to try his luck there. But scarcely had the Count entered the house, scarcely had he caught sight of Angelica's younger sister Gabrielle, when he awoke as from a dream. The elder sister appeared faded and colorless beside Gabrielle, whose beauty and charm so enthralled the Count that he begged her hand of her father. Count Set gave his consent easily, as there was no doubt of Gabrielle's feelings toward her suitor. Angelica did not show the slightest anger at her lover's faithlessness. He believes that he has forsaken me, the foolish boy. He does not perceive that he was but my toy, a toy of which I had tired. Thus she spoke in proud scorn, and not a look or an action on her part belied her words. But after the ceremonious betrothal of Gabrielle to Count S., Angelica was seldom seen by the members of her family. She did not appear at the dinner-table, and it was said that she spent most of her time walking alone in the neighboring wood. A strange occurrence disturbed the monotonous quiet of life in the castle. The hunters of Count Z., assisted by peasants from the village, had captured a band of gypsies who were accused of several robberies and murders which had happened recently in the neighborhood. The men were brought to the castle courtyard, fettered together on a long chain, while the women and children were packed on a cart. Noticeable among the last was a tall, haggard old woman of terrifying aspect, wrapped from head to foot in a red shawl, she stood upright in the cart, and in an imperious tone demanded that she should be allowed to descend. The guards were so awed by her manner and appearance that they obeyed her at once. Count Set came down to the courtyard and commanded that the gang should be placed in the prisons under the castle. Suddenly Countess Angelica rushed out of the door, her hair all loose, fear and anxiety in her pale face. Throwing herself on her knees, she cried in a piercing voice, Let these people go! Let these people go! They are innocent! Father, let these people go! If you shed one drop of their blood, I will pierce my heart with this knife! The countess swung a shining knife in the air, and then sank swooning to the ground. Yes, my beautiful darling, my golden child, I knew you would not let them hurt us, shrilled the old woman in red. She cowered beside the countess and pressed disgusting kisses to her face and breast, murmuring crazy words. 
She took from out the recesses of her shawl a little vial in which a tiny goldfish seemed to swim in some silver-clear liquid. She held the vial to the countess's heart. The latter regained consciousness immediately. When her eyes fell on the gypsy woman, she sprang up, clasped the old creature ardently in her arms, and hurried with her into the castle. Count Set. Gabrielle and her lover, who had come out during this scene, watched it in astonished awe. The gypsies appeared quite indifferent. They were loosed from their chains and taken separately to the prisons. Next morning Count Seth called the villagers together. The gypsies were led before them, and the Count announced that he had found them to be innocent of the crimes of which they were accused, and that he would grant them free passage through his domains. To the astonishment of all present, their fetters were struck off, and they were set at liberty. The red-shawled woman was not among them. It was whispered that the gypsy captain, recognizable from the golden chain about his neck, and the red feather in his high Spanish hat, had paid a secret visit to the Count's room the night before. But it was discovered, a short time after the release of the gypsies, that they were indeed guiltless of the robberies and murderers that had disturbed the district. The date set for Gabrielle's wedding approached. One day, to her great astonishment, she saw several large wagons in the courtyard being packed high with furniture, clothing, linen, with everything necessary for a complete household outfit. The wagons were driven away, and the following day Count Set explained that for many reasons he had thought it best to grant Angelica's odd request that she be allowed to set up her own establishment in his house in X. He had given the house to her, and had promised her that no member of the family, not even he himself, should enter it without her express permission. He added also that at her urgent request he had permitted his own valet to accompany her to take charge of her household. When the wedding festivities were over, Count S. and his bride departed for their home, where they spent a year in cloudless happiness. Then the Count's health failed mysteriously. It was as if some secret sorrow gnawed at his vitals, robbing him of joy and strength. All efforts of his young wife to discover the source of his trouble were fruitless. At last, when the constantly recurring fainting spells threatened to endanger his very life, he yielded to the entreaties of his physicians, and left his home, ostensibly for Pisa. His young wife was prevented from accompanying him by the delicate condition of her own health. "'And now,' said the doctor, "'the information given me by Countess S. became, from this point on, so rhapsodical that a keen observer only could guess at the true coherence of the story.' Her baby, a daughter, born during her husband's absence, was spirited away from the house, and all search for it was fruitless. Her grief at this loss deepened to despair, when she received a message from her father, stating that her husband, whom all believed to be in Pisa, had been found dying of heart trouble in Angelica's home in X, and that Angelica herself had become a dangerous maniac. The old count added that all this horror had so shaken his own nerves that he feared he would not long survive it. As soon as Gabrielle was able to leave her bed, she hurried to her father's castle. One night, prevented from sleeping by visions of the loved ones she had lost, she seemed to hear a faint crying like that of an infant before the door of her chamber. Lighting her candle, she opened the door. Great heaven! There cowered the old gypsy woman, wrapped in her red shawl, staring up at her with eyes that seemed already glazing in death. In her arms she held a little child whose crying had aroused the countess. Gabrielle's heart beat high with joy. It was her child, her lost daughter. She snatched the infant from the gypsy's arms, just as the woman fell at her feet lifeless. The countess's screams awoke the house, but the gypsy was quite dead, and no effort to revive her met with success. The old count hurried to X to endeavor to discover something that would throw light upon the mysterious disappearance and reappearance of the child. 
Angelica's madness had frightened away all her female servants. The valet alone remained with her. She appeared at first to have become quite calm and sensible, but when the Count told her the story of Gabrielle's child, she clapped her hands and laughed aloud, crying, Did the little darling arrive? You buried her, you say? How the feathers of the gold pheasant shine in the sun! Have you seen the green lion with the fiery blue eyes? Horrified, the Count perceived that Angelica's mind was gone beyond a doubt, and he resolved to take her back with him to his estates, in spite of the warnings of his old valet. And the mere suggestion of removing her from the house, Angelica's ravings increased to such an extent as to endanger her own life and that of the others. When a lucid interval came again, Angelica entreated her father with many tears to let her live and die in the house she had chosen. Touched by her terrible trouble, he granted her request, although he believed the confession which slipped from her lips during this scene to be a fantasy of her madness. She told him that Count S. had returned to her arms, and that the child which the gypsy had taken to her father's house was the fruit of their love. The rumor went abroad in the city that Count Z had taken the unfortunate woman to his home, but the truth was that she remained hidden in the deserted house under the care of the valet. Count Z died a short time ago, and Countess Gabrielle came here with her daughter Edwina to arrange some family affairs. It was not possible for her to avoid seeing her unfortunate sister. Strange things must have happened during this visit but the countess has not confided anything to me, saying merely that she had found it necessary to take the mad woman away from the old valet. It had been discovered that he had controlled her outbreaks by means of force and physical cruelty, and that also, allured by Angelica's assertions that she could make gold, he had allowed himself to assist her in her weird operations. It would be quite unnecessary, thus the physician ended his story, to say anything more to you about the deeper inward relationship of all these strange things. It is clear to my mind that it was you who brought about the catastrophe, a catastrophe which will mean recovery or speedy death for the sick woman. And now I will confess to you that I was not a little alarmed, horrified even to discover that when I had set myself in magnetic communication with you by placing my hand on your neck, I could see the picture in the mirror with my own eyes. We both know now that the reflection in the glass was the face of Countess Edwina. I repeat Dr. K.'s words in saying that to my mind also there is no further comment that can be made on all these facts. I consider it equally unnecessary to discuss at any further length with you now the mysterious relationship between Angelica Edwina, the old valet, and myself, a relationship which seemed the work of a malicious demon who was playing his tricks with us. I will add only that I left the city soon after all these events, driven from the place by an oppression I could not shake off. The uncanny sensation left me suddenly a month or so later, giving way to a feeling of intense relief that flowed through all my veins, with the warmth of an electric current. I am convinced that this change within me came about in the moment when the mad woman died. Thus did Theodore end his narrative. His friends had much to say about his strange adventure, and they agreed with him that the odd and unusual, and the truly marvellous as well, were mingled in a strange and gruesome manner in his story. When they parted for the night, Franz shook Theodore's hand gently, as he said with a smile, Good night, you Spallanzani bat, you. End of section 13. Read by Lars Rolander.